Is it all good? I mean, do you hear me fine? No, no issues? Yes, yes, okay, okay. So are you ready for cryptography talk? Yeah, cryptography! Awesome! <laughs> I'm super excited. Well, I know, I know this is Saturday and people don't get usually excited about cryptography, but sorry, here we are. So my name is Anastasi and today we're gonna talk with you about maintaining an open source cryptographic library and what kind the hell is this? Uh, our previous speaker, Roman, was telling a lot about maintaining Victoria metrics, right? And I felt him. Like every slide he, he told, like that people don't use, we expect them to use, people ask thousands of questions. Oh yeah, I know the drill. Um, today I will explain you how it works in cryptographic world and what we do to maintain the library, basically. So my name is Anastasi. You can find me on Twitter by my nickname, Vixentail. And I'm a security software engineer. I work at Kozak Labs, which is a security software company, and we deal a lot with cryptography. We have a lot of open source and free-to-use software, again, cryptography-related. All our software basically solves the one and only issue, <laughs> data protection, right? Different flavors, different approaches to solve the one and only problem, data protection. Searchable encryption, typical encryption, zero knowledge proofs, yada, 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 all these things just, again, to protect the data. We have cryptographers, we have software engineers, we have security engineers, and all of them are working on our software, and often other companies use our software, especially if they run um, like in critical infrastructure or fintech or AI, ML, they often need to protect some kind of data, so they often need to use some kind of tools, so they often use our tools, or they ask us to build custom solutions exactly for their use cases. So in crypto we trust. <laughs> but of course, as you know, cryptography is complicated, right? And it would be really good if there was a way to make cryptography easy, to make cryptography approachable. And today I will go and explain how we actually do it. Uh, first of all, have you, do, like, have you seen the updates of OWASP top 10? Can you please raise your hand if you did? Awesome. So for those of you who didn't, um, just in case, you know, OWASP, this is organization, like a community-driven organization that cares about security, right? And every couple of years, like four years in this example, they update their top 10 top 10 of popular mistakes, top 10 of risks that developers, like um, security risks, that developers do in their software. And OWASP just announced new top 10, 2021, and you see some, there are some changes in categories, and what is important for me here <laughs> to push you with ideas is number two, cryptographic failures which means that often our software, like software we create, it doesn't use correct ciphers, it doesn't encrypt all data it should encrypt, or even sometimes people use base64 as encryption. Yeah, 2021, right? So yeah, uh, let's talk about Temis. Temis is an open source cryptographic library. It's seven years old, so when Roman was say saying that Victoria Metrics is like three or four years old, oh yeah, I feel him, we have similar problems here. The idea behind Tem is that this is like a boring crypto library. I will explain what is boring crypto a little bit later. Uh, and Temis works across multiple platforms. Right now we calculate like 14 languages and platforms. It's a little bit complicated to calculate because you know like JavaScript as a language, right, not JS as a platform, and WebAssembly, they like not JS and WebAssembly, they both can use JavaScript. But these are two different platforms, two very different ecosystems. So we roughly calculate as 14 languages and platforms. And OWASP is quite popular as for cryptographic library, okay, okay. 
as for cryptographic library. And it even uh, was recommended by OWASP to use, especially on mobile devices, when you need to encrypt some data, when you need to build end-to-end -end encrypted applications. So, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, often, often Tempest is used in mobile applications, web application, um, AI, machine learning, fintech, yada, yada, yada. And there is a community of people who create libraries that encrypt some data, so they use Tempest and dependencies. So we basically live in dependency hell. Um, as one of like, as some of the exa as examples, maybe you have this application on your devices installed. Um, Bear, for example, this is like a node taken app, which has end-to-end -end encryption of user nodes. When we did this uh, two years ago, Bear uh, was like running on six million devices. I don't know how many devices, how many users they have right now, but really a lot. Another example is very popular, I can't name, but very popular AI slash ML application. You might probably also have it on your phones, but I can name it. Uh, and we use Temis there to protect ML models. Right, because this application generates ML models for, for the users, and we use Temis as a tool to protect those models against leakage, against tampering, against competitors. So the difference between Temis and other cryptographic libraries is that Temis is um, focused on use cases. We believe that, that developers did not, like, the developers should not know how to use cryptography, because cryptography is complicated. We believe that developers should be able to solve use cases. As a developer, I want to store my data securely, I want to send my data securely, I want to make sure that the data is secure. You know what I mean. And that's why Temis has all these crypto systems uh, that are focused on use cases. For example, if you are familiar with another very popular cryptographic library, Lipsodium, you, okay, Raise your hands who have tried Lipsodium. Awesome. So in Lipsodium, you probably know uh, Sealbox, right, interface, which is basically an encrypted container. You put some data in Sealbox. You like seal the box, and data stays encrypted. In Temis, we use the same idea, and Temis and Lipsodium are more or less the same year result. So like secure cell is encrypted container. Do you want to store data securely? Okay, you put it in secure cell, it stays secure. Secure message is a way to send data to someone from Alice to Bob, right? You put data in secure message, you send it. Secure session, well, the idea is pretty obvious. I won't talk a lot about cryptography here and just to give you an example. From maintainer perspective, from like, library designer perspective. Tempest looks like a cake because it has this modular, like layered structure. Uh, obviously, we didn't implement our own cryptography. We use OpenSSL, BoringSSL, LibreSSL, yeah, 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 whatever SSL. As a source of cryptographic primitives, we also had some time, we had even like um, libraries that worked with Ukrainian cipher standards, but let's not go there. Uh, and then layer by layer, from cryptographic primitives, from OpenSSL, if you ever used OpenSSL, you know how complicated it is to use. We build abstractions layers, um, two that ends up with language wrappers, because as a Python developer, I want to have my APIs really easy to use. R right, as like Go developer, I want my APIs really easy to use, and so on, so on, so on. And then now, this was a small introduction just of the landscape. So basically what we have, a huge library, cryptography, 14 platforms, popular, more or less, as for cryptographic library, and it should work. You know, it just works. So Temis supports several um, operating systems. But of course, of course you know that operating system is not only its name, right? They have versions. They have um, like bits, 
uh, right? And to, to be able, for users to be able to install library on their favorite operating system, we need to build a package for this system. And of course, when we go deeper, we don't forget about mobile systems. <laughs> we have really a lot of them, right? So as a, users, I sh as a user, I should be able to install Tamis on a system I like. Otherwise, I will go and say, ah, oh, I don't like this library. And now I have a question for you. How do you think for cryptographic library? Well, for any, okay, okay, for any library, what is the most important thing? This library to be easy to use? I mean, as a developer, I can install it and start using it easily, right? Or this library should be hard to misuse. What do you think? Okay, who votes for easy to use? Is it more important for the library to be easy to use? Okay, like one fourth of the audience. Who votes for hard to misuse? Wow. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So I see that you prefer uh, to have some troubles during integration, but not to have issues during maintaining, right? It was a tricky question. <laughs> Because I believe that the library should have both. Uh, because what means easy to use? Take a look on this. Uh, this is, um, I copy pasted it from the readme from one very, very popular open source library, cryptographic library. Can you guess the library? Say it again. Open SSL, <laughs> right. <laughs> Obviously. No one will use your library if they won't be able to install it. And you know, many people when they see the readme like this, they like, oh no, <laughs> go and <clears throat> I will select another library. And this is what easy to use means. So when we are talking about uh, Tamis and about all this operating system it supports, it means that we as maintainers should create packages and push packages to all these, uh, to all the popular package managers on these operating systems, right? And now let's talk about languages. <laughs> because again, as a Python developer, I want you to be able to do pip install. As Node.js developer, I want to be able to do npm install. As mobile developer, as iOS developer, I don't want to know about anything. I just want to, you know, enter one line in my configuration file and hope it work. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I'm just saying that often um, when we are using library, you know, as the users, as developers, sometimes we don't understand and we don't appreciate how much efforts maintainers put to make this library available on our favorite operating system, on our favorite language, because this doesn't happen magically. We have scripts to be able to publish package and submit it to each of these package managers. And every each of them is a hell. They have their own ideas of what is good and what is wrong. They have their own rules. They have their own support of uh, semver, of the versioning, right? And let's, let's, I will give you an example, right? Because previously I was doing a lot of mobile application development, so iOS as ecosystem, like all this Apple ecosystem, is really familiar for me. So to give you an example, um, in iOS world, we have two languages. Objective-C, old and boring, Swift, new and shiny. Then we have iOS, we have I iPhones and iPads and MacBooks. And every year, Apple does the same thing again and again. They update iPhone, they update Swift version. Many Swift versions are not compatible. Well, right now it's easier. They are more or less compatible. For each Swift version, Apple updates Xcode, the software you, you need to use, right? And they, offer, they off also update like iOS, and of course, community has some package managers, so in iOS uh, development world, developers use three package managers. Cocoa Pods, Cartage, 
and Swift package managers. Three popular package managers. So every year we have the same loop again and again. iOS update, Swift update, Xcode update, new devices, a new cartage update, yada, 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 yada. And you know what Apple did two years ago? They introduced Apple Silicon. <laughs> completely new CPU architecture. Well, not completely new, but still. And you know what it means? That OpenSSL, as OpenSSL, you know, they needed to push some changes to, to build OpenSSL for Apple Silicon. Then we, as we have our own fork of OpenSSL, obviously, we need to build um, packages for Cartage, CocoaPod, and Swift Package Manager of this OpenSSL and make sure it works on iOS and macOS. Then we need to push it to Temis to build packages of Temis and make sure that this result, our cherry Temis library, works on Apple Silicon. And of course, this cycle, it, it takes time and some efforts. And of course, it leads to this in our GitHub. Oh, sorry, this doesn't work with this version of this when I use this and my laptop is this. You know, I think iOS is the most popular <laughs> label in our GitHub issue tracker because it's always like something is not working correctly on iOS. Yeah. Joy. And again, this is only one of 14 systems. I don't say that any system is as fragile as iOS, but still, every operating system, every community, every programming language, they have their own rules, they have their own process. You know, it's not about the language itself, it's not about the sy syntax of the language, it's more about of the process, how developers are used to do things. This is how developers do things in Apple world. So this, it was my first point about easy to use. To make library easy to use, sometimes it's complicated. Let's talk about hard to misuse, because most of you voted for hard to misuse. So what it means for cryptographic library to be hard to misuse? Let me show you two quotes. Uh, first is by Daniel Bernstein. OK, OK, please raise your hand if you know who is Daniel Bernstein. Awesome. So this is a very famous guy, cryptographer. Okay. Uh, so he, so he told once that um, boring cryptography is a very good idea. Boring cryptography means that cryptographic software just works. It's very boring. Boring means good. Okay? So developers should be bored when they use this cryptographic library because they don't need to handle all these parameters. They don't need to update this library. They don't need to do anything. It's very boring. Boring crypto means good crypto, means easy to use, hard to misuse cryptography. Second quote is by Bruce Schneier. Do you know who is Bruce Schneier? Okay, okay, another security guy, okay? So <laughs> Bruce Schneier told us that we should not give user options because if we give users options, they misuse our software. <laughs> we should give like only one button, do your best. You know, and these two principles, boring cryptography and don't give user options, is the idea how to make your library hard to misuse for developers. For example, <laughs> looks nice, right? This is iOS encryption, uh, IES, AES encryption cipher. This is AES encryption in Common Crypto library. Common Crypto was one of the fundamental libraries in Apple world. Luckily, right now, Apple has pushed new library, CryptoKit, which is like two years old. But this is what developers needed to do every time they wanted just to encrypt data. Yeah, nice function with how many? 12 parameters. And as a developer, you should be able to define which cipher you want to use, which cipher mode you want to use, what is your key, what is your key length, what is your init vector, what is your init vector length, what is your output buffer, what is your output buffer length. Yada, yada, not boring. Too many mistakes. 
Fortunately, in um, like the idea of boring crypto is not a new idea, so many libraries try to decrease the load and try to make the APIs easier. And this is one of the examples. This is another very popular library in iOS world. And I just copy pasted it from the readme. Can you find, again, this is IS encryption, just encryption, you know, very simple operation. Can you find mistakes? We are looking for cryptographic mistakes here. Ideas? Say it again. What is the mode of operation? Yeah, we don't see it here. I will tell you, it's CBC. Okay, now you tell me, IS, CBC, good or bad? Yeah, that's not obvious, but IS, CBC, good or bad? Bad, bad. okay. <sighs> Let's not go there. Let's just say bad. Yeah, but yeah, of course it depends on the use case. Other mistakes, other things. Imagine this is the readme of the library. So as a developer who does, uh, yes, Absolutely, yeah, you're correct. Using this key in example means that many developers will just continue using these keys. And this library is very, very popular, and I just don't know how many mobile applications still use this key, 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 key as a key. And of course, this is a very bad key from cryptographic perspective. It, it's low entropy key. Another thing, IV, which is init vector, which is in IIS ciphers, should be random and long for every encryption. If you are not cryptographer, how you will know this? This library is very easy to misuse, although it looks like easy, right, two lines. Uh, just to give you an example how we saw similar things in Temis, basi basically the same idea, like three lines of code when you encrypt the data, but with a handy function to generate symmetric key for you, because you want your encryption to have long and nice, uh, like strong entropy keys, then no parameters, no IV, no padding. Because as developers, not cryptographers, you don't know what those things mean, right? Everything, like all good choices, are being inside the library, are being hidden from you as a developers, because you're developers, because you don't know what is like what cryptographic ciphers to use. We even went further, and we introduced a so-called passphrases API. When, as a user, you, and you input your password, like passphrase, and Temis then uses KDF, key derivation function, to create strong cryptographic key from this passphrase, and then uses this key to encrypt the data. Right, so try, we try to eliminate mistakes because obviously developers are not cryptographers, they don't know where mistakes are. And of course it looks similar for, for all the 14 platforms with a similar API, with, this is very important, with a similar order of parameters. <laughs> because we found out that if one language, let's say, Temis on Ruby, if it uses another order of parameters in functions, developers won't read the docs and will just blindly copy-paste, you know. So we made sure that API looks the same across all the platforms. So if you try to use Intemis for one platform, you basically have all important knowledge you need to use it to another platform, which makes, uh, which makes Temis so popular for building end-to-end -end encrypted applications because mostly you have several platforms and you want just one library to rule them all. Okay, okay, okay. Let's talk, forget about cryptography. Let's talk about software engineer. Uh, Roman before me, he showed you numbers about how many tests they have. I have very similar screenshots. I will also show you numbers with lines of code. So here you can see that Temis score has 35 thousands lines of code. Not a huge library. 35,000, well, okay -ish. Can you Can you guess how many lines of code our tests folder has? 
200,000, close enough. 10 times more. Who are you? Have you read the sources of Temis? <laughs> yes, tame 10 times more. Uh, so 341,000 lines of code, basically 10 times more. Because, yeah. Of course, a lot of them are copy-paste, <laughs> obviously. I will, I will tell you, because when you have 14 platforms, you copy-paste a lot of things, you know. You automate and you create templates, you create your own DSL, your own language, because you don't want to code on 14 different languages. Uh, for, um, I would say yes, but of course no. Unfortunately, we're not so uh, smart to template everything. No, most of them were written by humans. We use, we use temp I will show you an example. We use templates a lot when uh, we do integration tests, meaning uh, tests across platforms, you know, when we make sure that Python Temis can encrypt data and then Ruby Temis can decrypt data. For, as we have 14 platforms, writing all these metrics would take some time, yeah. So does this mean we can divide it by 14? You can divide it by anything, <laughs> but this is a good illustration, okay? Don't ruin my example, please. 10 times more. Uh, to give you, again, software engineering, to give you an illustration, what kind of tests are those? Obviously, we have cryptography tests, like NIST tests, to make sure that random is random enough. You know what I mean. Random number generator, problem, entropy, yada, yada, yada. So we have NIST tests to make sure that random is random enough. Then we use a lot of uh, fuzzing. We basically, we are big fans of fuzzing. You know what fuzzing is. Raise your hand if you know what is fuzzing, if you ever use that. Okay, okay. For those who don't know, fuzzing is like automated testing, where basically you, <laughs> you use random, you use fuzzing as a tool, and it will try to randomize inputs in your functions. So instead of writing manual tests, when you uh, test all the inputs, you know, like empty string, null, uh, integer max, integer mean, instead of writing all these manual tests, use fuzzing tool, and it tries to randomize inputs and find edge cases in your software where it crashes. Awesome. It finds really nice corner cases. We use fuzzing a lot, especially for the core. And then we use a lot of uh, static code analyzers, memory sanitizers, yada, 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 just to make sure that we, have, we don't have obvious mistakes. As I previously mentioned, we use a lot of integration tests and backward compatibility tests. Backward compatibility means that our users that use Temis version something on language something should be able to decrypt data. It's very important in cryptography. Not encryption is important, decryption is important. Right? So that other users that use Temis of newer version on their language can decrypt data of Temis from previous version of another language. Okay, okay, so backwards compatibility and integration tests. And we found so many issues because of these tests. I really like them. Fortunately, Temis is stable for many years already, so I'm uh, pretty calm. And we use, as we have a lot of tests, we, have, we use a lot of CI tools. Uh, we mostly use GitHub Actions right now on GitHub to test everything. We use CircleCI for nightly builds. We use Bitrise for iOS, Android, and macOS, because, you know, Apple is a different world. And uh, to do all these integration tests, to do all these backward compatibility tests, yada, yada, we have our own CI servers uh, that use BuildBot. Because we try to calculate how much money it will cost to run all these integration tests between 14 platforms and 10 operating systems and different Temis versions, and that's a lot of money. So instead of using cloud, CI CD, we use our own build board on our own hardware and we pay for that. Yeah, open source, they say. Mm -hmm. Free, okay. I explained a lot about testing in this series of blog posts, so if you're curious what tools you can use in your library to make sure, like to automate security testing, 
make picture of the slides because then on the link there is a series of four blog posts about tools we use. Yes, I'll wait. Okay, done, ready to go? No worries, I will share the slides, so. Uh, and of course, uh, previously I talked about just tests, but as a, secu as a cryptography library, we should also do all the kind of security tests. So we do all the kind of security tests, cryptographic tests, and we use like internal, uh, we use our cryptographers who are not developing Tamis to review any cryptographic changes, and we often use external cryptographers and external engineers. And we found some issues uh, thanks to the community, thanks to external you know, people who are just curious to find things. And now, at the end of my talk, I would like to illustrate a lot of things that Roman was talking about. Community, community and documentation and all these things. So, so before I continue, have you, like, how often do you read readmes of the libraries you use? Each time? Each time this person uses libraries, they read readme. Wow, you have, yeah, 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 you have too much free time. You know, most developers just... Okay, okay, let's, let's do it. If you have free time, feel free to read our document, it's great. If you notice something, just let me know, okay? If you like to read docs, I will be happy. So in Tamis, uh, we also thought that developers will read readme. So we wrote a lot of readmes, a lot of documentation for every language we support for all these crypto systems, for all these you know, uh, cryptography details. We even uh, wrote examples of cryptographic attacks. We wrote examples of key management, right? As a user, how you should manage keys, what is good, what is bad. But many users say, we don't want to read. Just give me the code. I don't want to read the docs. I want code. We said, OK, no worries. We will make you code pieces. And we, we created, we put into our docs these safe to copy paste code pieces. You know, code examples like code snippets that are OK to blindly copy paste and put in your, in your software without any hard coded key, 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 key things. And we thought, now users will be happy. You know what users responded? <laughs> but how to use these pieces in our application, right? OK, I am copy pasting it, but what to do next? We were, <clears throat> right, so, OK, OK, we are very user oriented, we understand things. And as maintainers, we want to make community happy. So our step number three was to create example application. And to give you an example, example of example, uh, one million lines of code of example applications comparing to 35,000 lines of code of the library, right? 10 times more of tests and how many, three times more of examples, that's a lot of additional lines of code. And we thought, OK, OK, we created this example application. It's really you know, a small and simple demo application that show how to use our library. You know what community replied? But I'm building my own application. Yes, yes, you have your example, but I'm building some unique application. How I understand what from your example to use in my application? Because cryptography is complicated, apparently, right? And we thought, okay, 
Okay, okay, okay. We can handle it. We can handle it. And now uh, step number four was to create a lot of use case specific applications, tutorials, like real application, free and open source, and to end encrypted chats, okay. Some um, secret storage things, secret storage like applications, okay. You know, like real applications for real use cases. And obviously to support them, add, add these lines of code to our lines of code. And you know what community told us? <laughs> yeah, we want more. They told us that, okay, okay, your applications are working, <laughs> but my applications that I, don't, that I build don't work. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> We were like, <clears throat> okay, people, okay, cryptography is complicated. We are good maintainers, so we will make another step. And we created so-called uh, so -called codeless simulators, right? So we now have our own servers that has Temis, and they have a UI, like web interface, web application, where you as developer can copy-paste your encrypted data and make sure that somebody else's computer can decrypt this data, right? Just to make sure that you have configured everything correctly. Or in this example, for example, uh, in this example, for example, I am doing a mobile application that communicates on the backend and uses this secure, uh, secure session, encrypted channel. And I use Temis Simulator as Bob. You know, my application is Alice and it's sending data to Bob. And if Bob, if somebody else, computer, can decrypt my application, my, my data, it means that my application is configured correctly. Because cryptography is apparently complicated, and apparently one computer is not enough to make sure that it works. Right, so we created these codeless simulators, and fortunately we stopped here. <laughs> and of course people continue complaining, you know, like in Ukrainian, люди bitkaются. Whatever you do, люди bitkaются. Uh, but these were our like, last step in this journey, so obviously one readme is not enough. Yeah, I'm dropping up. Obviously, right, one readme is not enough. Yes, language-specific readme, cool. Yes, ready to copy-paste code snippets, awesome. Example applications, great. Real applications and tutorial, perfect. Simulators, cool. So yeah, um, just to give you an illustration, four years ago on this stage, Four years ago, on this stage, CTO of Kozak Labs, Eugene, was doing another talk related to open source and community. And this was one of his slides. Yeah. No, community is great, especially when you're a maintainer of a complicated open source cryptographic library. Community is awesome. So yeah, my key points, and of course, for, for listening to cryptographic, uh, for cryptographic talk, you deserve a kitten, right? So the key points, if someone will tell you, hey, please, can you maintain the cryptographic library, say no. <laughs> because that's a hell. There's a lot of things to handle. And of course, luckily, we have a team. Right, so obviously I'm maintaining Temis for four years already, but we have a team. We have DevOps engineers, security engineers, cryptographers. You know, we have people who write Python, we have people who write Go. Without team, maintaining library is overcomplicated. At the, uh, from the another perspective, as security company, why we do that, why we maintain Temis, because as I mentioned previously, it makes data security easy to use and hard to misuse for developers that don't know cryptography, and that's fine. We use Temis a lot in our own software, we rely on it, so we make sure it's correct. <laughs> we make sure that we don't have any backdoors there. And um, Roma, previous speaker, he told a lot about um, statistics and analytics, right? As cryptographic library, we don't have 
any analytics from our library for obvious reasons. We don't want people, you know, to think that we steal their data. So yeah, it works. It works supporting library when you can improve your work if you use this library. And just to finalize my talk, I just want to make to tell you that we are hiring. Uh, right now we have a lot of open positions, especially for SRE, site reliability engineers. And if you read this book, okay, raise your hands who read this book. Okay, okay, I will, I will remember your faces. So if you read this book, if you know what I mean, please apply. Uh, we have the position description on Doe, and this is like a QR code for Doe. Or if you don't want to apply, just want to, to hear how we work and things like that, ping me. My name is Anastasi, my nickname is Vixentail, and thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, actually, we have run out of time, absolutely. Oh. Let's have two questions, okay? Okay. The because most... who needs lunch when you can talk about cryptography, right? Mm. Let's try. Let's try to be extremely quick. Oh, yeah, that's... No. That's difficult, I see. Mm -hmm. Impossible. Anastasia, thank you for your great speech. You said at the beginning that cryptography is not interesting and boring, and we see that it's not uh, the case. So thank you. Actually, I have a, uh, a couple of questions, and we ran out of time. So please pick any of the questions you would like uh, and answer. Yeah, so just remember how I look like. <laughs> <laughs> you can find me here. I, I find uh, these questions uh, interesting for people. So yeah, please go any, ahead. Any other question you, you can pick. So first question, can you please uh, evaluate a bit more about the use cases of your library? Is it for uh, encrypting the files, uh, folders, or volumes, partitions, or it's used for network encryption? Because I don't feel it was stated enough. Uh, yeah, and the second uh, question is, uh, you mentioned that uh, your library relies on some other li libraries, like OpenSSL. So how do you deal with vulnerabilities of that libraries? We remember a couple of years ago, a great uh, case with OpenSSL. Vulnerabilities is the second question. And the third is uh, maybe addition to the second. How about the hardware vulnerabilities like processor, uh, spectre, and meltdown? How do you deal with that? Okay, cases? let's divide this to two questions use cases and how we deal with vulnerabilities of OpenSSL. Yes. Which thanks. question, like, let's vote? Which answer you want to hear? Use cases? No one cares. Vulnerabilities? Yeah, awesome. So, uh, the answer is easy. <laughs> when your library has dependencies, obviously de uh, if dependency is vulnerable, your library is vulnerable, right? So what you can do about that? Patch your dependencies. In case of OpenSSL, <laughs> that's quite complicated. You know, right now, uh, OpenSSL has released OpenSSL 3 dot zero. Wow. But previously, and they start using Semver, uh, semantic versioning. Previously, OpenSSL didn't use Semver. They had um, their, like, um, their versions like 1.1.1G. Awesome. Doesn't work with many other platforms. So when OpenSSL has uh, has vulnerabilities, first of all, in our in our case, in case of Temis, we are quite lucky because OpenSSL is huge, and we use only small small part of it, right? So many vulnerabilities. When we see new vulnerabilities, we triage, triage, we evaluate if this vulnerability happened to any code that we use that we call or not. If it happens in code we call, we try to update OpenSSL as fast as possible. As I previously mentioned, with all these systems, sometimes it's not as fast as we would like it to be. And we try to avoid OpenSSL. Like we have, <laughs> we, um, 
Unfortunately, we use OpenSSL just because it works almost everywhere. Fortunately, OpenSSL has a lot of other forks, like Boring SSL, which is fork from Google for many, many years. So for many platforms, we suggest using Boring SSL, and we build TMS with Boring SSL instead, like for Android, for example. For other platforms, LibreSSL is available. Our plan was to get, to get read from OpenSSL at all, but unfortunately, Boring SSL is a mess, right? So OpenSSL is a mess, Boring SSL is a mess, another kind of mess. They don't have any problems with semantic versioning because they don't use any versioning at all. <laughs> so yeah, um, the simple answer is obviously patch your vulnerabilities. Uh, uh, <laughs> Yeah, patch your vulnerabilities, patch your dependencies, triage if there is chance that your library uses this code and you need to patch it quite soon, and get rid of dependencies. Uh, fortunately, OpenSSL, Boring SSL, and all the other SSLs, it's just the only one dependency of Temis, so, which is not the case if you use, if you write web applications, for example. <laughs> I think people who write web application and have this, you know, 100,000 of critical vulnerabilities every time they run NPM audit, they are in trouble. We are quite fine. I hope I answered your question. So, lunch or another question? Lunch. Aww. <laughs> uh, you know, we uh, have only 50 minutes of lunch left. Uh, not 15, 50. It's Five better. Zero. Uh, but still not very long. Uh, so thank you for your talk.